What's up, ladies and gentlemen? Welcome back to another episode. This one is amazing. You know, I think it's really interesting. I think it was Benjamin Franklin who originally said, you know, a dollar, a penny saved, I think is how he said it. A penny saved is a penny earned. And so when you think about saving money, what do you think? Well, you think about like putting money in a savings account, or but do you really think about just paying less in taxes? You know, and that is really what this episode is all about. And you might you might be thinking, well, Sam, I don't I don't actually pay that much in taxes. I'm I'm pretty good with that. Well, what if you could pay zero in taxes? Right. And that's kind of the goal of this episode where I dive in with Amanda Han, who is just a, a, a CPA, a tax expert, but and an investor herself, which guys, you shouldn't really, I mean, I'm just going to come out and say this. You shouldn't really be listening to a CPA in my humble opinion, but the CPAs probably disagree with me about now. And that that's not also an investor. And we talk about that a little bit on the show as well with Amanda, how, you know, she thought she did taxes for real estate investors. She thought she knew real estate, but then when she became an investor herself, then she really knew real estate. And now she's gone on to do, you know, real estate and taxes for some of the biggest, the biggest names out there, Brandon Turner being one of them. And so this episode is really a lot about, it is some of the basics. If you've been, if you're deep into this, then you might know some of these concepts already, but we go into them a little bit deeper. We go into how you can use them. Things such as like, how do you gain that real estate professional status? What does that mean? What does that look like? What's the short-term rental loophole to get around the real estate professional status? What does it look like to do a 1031 exchange? What is bonus depreciation? What is accelerated depreciation? What the heck is depreciation in general? And look, I know we're all at different stages in our real estate journey, but when I first started, even, even five, six, seven years ago, I, I couldn't have told you the definition of these things. It's really Really only as I begin to scale, as I begin to grow, that I've started to realize the power of some of these things. And when I say power, I mean like we're talking the difference in hundreds of thousands of dollars that I would have had to pay in taxes. That's the power of this stuff. So whether you need it right now or you need to teach someone else this concept or share it with someone that you know has been complaining about paying too much taxes, or maybe someone that you know is on a big high W-2 that doesn't even know how much they pay in taxes. That's even worse, right? They're just like, I don't know. I just get my check. But that can happen too. And it's just so imp- important that we all start paying attention to this, so ways that we can legally mitigate, and reduce our taxes even to zero. We even touch on how a private jet can be used for that purpose. So without further ado, let's dive into this awesome episode with Amanda Hahn. I'm excited that you're here. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much for being on the podcast. It's really an honor to have you. And look, I know that you know if someone sees you today and they follow you on social, mm-hmm. they know that you know, so much about you and that you have contributed to Forbes. You do taxes for some very big name individuals, uh, a mutual friend of ours, Brandon Turner. I know you've worked with him for a, a, a long time. And so I think one of my first questions for you is just how in the world did you get to where you are right now? I'd love to hear a little bit about your story. That's who you are now. Who was Amanda Hahn? <laughs> Uh, gosh, well, you know, I think um, I'm sure most of our audience have heard of the book Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Yes. Um, so it was something really interesting when I read the book is I realized that I actually grew up with also Rich Dad, Poor Dad. But for me, it was one and the same person. So believe it or not. Um, <laughs> so I come from a family of entrepreneurs. My grandparents immigrated to the U.S. Um, and they were real estate investors. They had their own business, both in Asia and in the U.S. And um, my parents growing up, they were also business owners, too, like my dad and my grandma operated a little bread bakery. So when I was really little, I would work I mean, not work, but I was there because that was how you babysat kids back in the days um, at the bread store. And I would like take people's money. And I love counting money back when I was <laughs> really, really young, counting the bread inventory. And um, where we lived was actually where my grandparents uh, operate. My grandparents owned the whole townhouse community. Um, and I was kind of like growing up as the landlord's grandkids. So... Um, but you would think that, oh, Amanda grew up that way with entrepreneur, you know, like third generation. She must just, you know, like became this business owner. But it was actually the, it was more like the poor dad side of my family where my whole family really never encouraged me to do business or investing. It was just always that traditional, like go to school, get good grades, get a stable job um, was kind of how I was taught growing up. And what more stable job is like than accounting, right? Everybody needs accounting. Uh, <laughs> I, I remember my mom used to tell me like, oh, you should be an accountant because it's stable. Eventually you're gonna have kids, be a mom. And so you're gonna get to control your work schedule. Um, so yeah, very early on, I was kind of like, I don't know, that was a path set out for me. And, you know, trying to be the good kid, I just 
never questioned it. And, um, you know, graduated college, got my degree. I was really fortunate I ended up in my first job was one of the big four international accounting firms. So got my feet wet, a lot of really great experience. I happened to end up in the real estate specialty group. So uh, all of my clients from day one were the large real estate development companies, builders and um yeah, and even then I, Amanda, I was like, I'm never gonna do real estate because I grew up watching my grandparents do real estate. My grandpa had to like go around the community, pick up trash and deal with tenants who didn't pay. You know, I was like, that's definitely not what I'm doing. I'm getting a corporate job, you know, talk on conference calls all day. Um, and it wasn't until I read Robert's book <laughs> And I was like, man, I really should, uh, you know, try to create some income outside of my job. <laughs> so even the fact that you were like looking over people's returns, you were seeing depreciation, I'm sure you're seeing bonus depreciation, all of which we'll get into in this, in this, in this chat with you and how the power of that you still were like, yeah, no, I don't want to do this. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's so weird because I don't know if, you know, other professions feel the same. But when I was working, I did we did the tax returns uh, for other people. But to me, those were just numbers. You know, it's kind of like, oh, just putting numbers on forms. And I think that's a downside of, of being having CPAs is a lot of people approach it with numbers on forms, get the right numbers, the right additions, the right forms and send it out. I never really looked at it from like what exactly was going on. You know, what exactly was I doing? How was it impacting the taxpayer? Um, until my husband actually, uh, who's now in the firm with me, we worked together and he read Robert Kiyosaki's book and I remember where it was like at nighttime and he turned to me in bed and he was like, hey, this year we're going to buy some rental properties. And I was like, you're out of your mind. <laughs> I am not going to buy rental real estate. <laughs> yeah. oh, so I think it was he, he was the one that was kind of like, you know, we do this as our job. Maybe right. we should just do it for ourselves. <laughs> and that made the transition for you into becoming an investor. How did becoming an investor? I'd love for people to hear this from you. How did that change how you looked at those tax returns? Did it change anything or were you just like, oh, I'm experiencing what I've seen? Yeah. Oh, for sure. It changed drastically. It made my job so much more interesting to me, right? Because then it was more than just numbers on forms. I was looking at it from all different angles. Like what, you know, if I did this, this that impacted somebody. Um, this is, you know, if they bought property here and did these things, that's kind of how it impacted. So certainly, um, you know, maybe people say like you can learn about stuff like real estate, you can learn about how to invest, but until you invest, you don't really know what there is to know. And that's kind of how it was, at least for us with respect to taxes and investing. It was really interesting because the clients we worked with at the big firms were all very wealthy people. And so it was not uncommon for them to call us all the time, ask us questions before they did things. And just, they were very well versed in like what had to happen from training and like how you use your CPA, how you're supposed to work with your CPA. Um, when we started investing, believe it or not, we didn't know how to do real estate. Like we did taxes for years, but we're like, how, where do I find a property? How do I do due diligence? How do I make offers? And so we started going to like local real estate meetups and meeting with just everyday investors. And that was when we first realized like, oh, people had no idea what we were talking about. When we talk about cost segregation or a bonus depreciation, they're just like, it was like a whole new language to them. Um, I think that's when we kind of found our passion. Like, oh, we didn't even know that people didn't understand all these like basic things for us. You know, we're like, we really need to make sure investors sort of get a, a basic understanding of all the benefits of investing in real estate. Yeah, that's powerful. And I want to get into, I do want to get into how you are supposed to use your CPA. I think that's a valuable point. I love that. I'll get into cost segregation and bonus depreciation. I think when I was looking for a CPA, I remember one of the common pieces of advice that came up for me was, yeah, you want to find a CPA, you want to find someone on your team in that category of your business that has invested before. I just remember that being like one of the number one things. And I think it's really beautiful that you're saying like, hey, there's a difference between knowing and then like knowing, like you've done it knowing, right? Theoretical knowledge versus that actual knowledge. And I think that's something really powerful about the people that use you and your firm is like, you're like, hey, we're in the game too. <laughs> we're, not <coming laughs> we're in the game too. And that's powerful. 
Yeah, and I think a lot of the conversation, I think when, when we talk about tax planning or taxes in general, people kind of dread it, right? It's like nobody likes to talk about taxes. But really, for a lot of our clients, after working with us for a couple of years, they tend to love taxes because especially since our clients are real estate investors, when you understand how taxes actually help you if you're doing it correctly, they start to love talking about it. And that's why you hear like a lot of our clients are big on social media, you know, Brandon is an example, and he's always out there talking about how he saves taxes, he pays no taxes. And before I was kind of anxious, you know, when I would first start hearing my clients talk, I'm like, oh my gosh, I hope they're saying the right things and they're not giving out wrong information. Uh, but I just kind of learned over the years, like it's really good, you know, because I think it, when I say it, people hear it one way, but when our clients say it, because they're the full-time investors, um, then the audience hear it a little bit differently and they can relate to um, you know, kind of what's coming, it's just the same topic, but being said differently resonates with a lot of people. So yeah, that's, be that's beautiful. So if you want to, so keep listening, if you want to find out how you can pay zero in taxes, but let's dive into a question that I have that one of my students actually proposed to me and Amanda, I'm okay. just going to throw this your way. I have not told you this question in advance. I just told you I was going to throw one your way. So <laughs> audiences, you know, she's not pre been preparing for this. I'm just going to read you a little thing that he wrote. Okay. It's a specific situation. Okay. He okay. says, my wife is obsessed trying to start real estate investing. She just asked me if she can spend money on Sam's course. Background, dual income couple making $600,000 with two kids. Maxed 401ks for the last five years since moving away from Canada to California. About 45% of gross goes to taxes. Wife trying to find ways to lower tax and one way occurring, according to her is real estate investing. We have a primary residence. Uh, in California with eight years left on the mortgage, other properties in Canada with about a 5K net loss a year, decreasing yearly with rent increase and $400,000 of equity. Any advice or general situations? And I know that this, you know, how would you uh, take someone like this that's in this situation that's spending 45% yeah. cent? I am a real estate investor. So for anybody spending 45% of their gross income towards taxes just sounds crazy to me. Where would you start with the situation, Amanda? Yeah, you know, it's really interesting. First, I would like to challenge that number because if someone lives in California, they're making $600,000 of income, they're probably close to 50% tax um, just based on the rates. So, uh, <laughs> so first off, that's probably, you know, not what they wanted to hear, but a bit um, underestimating a little bit, maybe. <laughs> yeah, we're underestimating our cost of tax. Yeah. Um, so yeah, not uncommon for us, you know, we work with investors of all income levels uh, nationwide and, and I am in California myself. So I know California is a whole different country uh, when it comes to taxes. But, um, you know, in terms of options, I mean, there's so many different things to consider. But if we're talking specifically about real estate, because like you said, this person did the traditional max 401k writing off part of their uh, mortgage interest on their home, right? That's kind of the cap of what usually people end. But when you're a real estate investor, then the doors uh, open up for a lot of different options in terms of ways to reduce taxes. So if we're going the traditional, um, like long-term rental route, and that includes the co-living space, multifamily, just all kinds of regular long-term tenants, um, Usually, if both spouse continue to work full time at their jobs, then what we want to do is create tax free or tax efficient rental income. Right. So we're going to start building up a portfolio of rental real estate, co-living, co multifamily, whatever it happens to be. We're going to generate more income through cash flow and then appreciation, but really pay little to no taxes on it. Because now all of a sudden, instead of being a just W-2 income where we have virtually no write offs, now you are the head of a real estate investor. You start to be able to take tax deductions against all that rental income you generate. Right. So home office, business use of your car, business meals, business travel. There's all these things now that open up the door for us to be able to use all those expenses against the rental income we create. Now, if this person or their spouse is like, uh, well, maybe we want to be um, have our income be optional, right? Maybe we're not going to work full time or one of us will start working part time uh, or just stop working and transition to real estate full time. That's where the magic happens, where you can potentially use the rental losses, not just against the rental income, but also against W-2 income as well. So if one person is still working full time, the other goes down to part time, but 
does more and more real estate may be possible for them to then become a real estate professional in the eyes of the IRS and then start using the rental loss against all types of income, not just rental income. Um, and, I mean, we do have clients who just kind of don't ever plan to stop working. You know, they, they, they in the foreseeable future, probably want to both work full time at their job for the next 10 years. Um, in those scenarios, sometimes it could make sense to start out with a short term rental property uh, because there are ways for you to use short term rental losses against W-2 income, even though you're still working full time in real estate is sort of just like a side hustle. But, you know, in all three scenarios, we're trying to build that fact pattern where now for the first time we have better income we're making that we don't have to pay so much taxes on. And when you say losses, just for clarity for the audience, you're not necessarily saying that that property loses money. You're saying depreciation on that property, which is going to look like a loss on your tax return. Is that correct? For sure. When we talk about losses, we're always talking tax losses. So frequent, most commonly, it's like we still have cash flow, we still have appreciation but we create a tax loss through things like depreciation, through things like maximizing our write-offs. You know, what are all the business expenses I have? What are all the personal expenses I have that have business components that I can now legitimately claim it as business deductions? Right. So this is a nice segue into, in the most simple terms, for, for someone who might be new to this space, looking to create some of those tax losses like you're talking about. And even that in and of itself, Amanda, is such a cool thing for, for people that are new to this space of like, hey, I want to create, I'm looking to create a loss. Like that doesn't sound cool. Why would I want to create that? But to recognize that the goal of the rich is to look like we make no money, right? Um, <laughs> different mindset. That's a different hat to wear than most people, which anybody who's making $600,000 a year at one point in their life had to think that that was the, the end all be all right. Oh, I can make this much money, but then things change. And so I think my question is, okay, so we're talking about these tax losses in the most simple of terms. How could you explain to someone what exactly is depreciation and how does that help create this tax loss? Sure. So uh, depreciation is something that the IRS allows real estate investors to take advantage of. Um, and basically the premise behind it is they say, okay, you buy a rental property within that rental property is a building that you purchase. And over time, there's going to be wear and tear on that building, right? As time goes on, there's things will break and there's going to be wear and tear of the building. And so, but instead of just having like you know, random ways to quantify the wear and tear of each building. They just say, well, let's create a set of laws where regardless of whether your property is actually having wear and tear, regardless of whether it's actually appreciating in value or not, we're just going to get you a set rule that says every year you get to depreciate or write off a portion of that purchase price of your building. And usually that's over 27 and a half years. So if I buy a, you know, a, a $500,000 building, I take 500,000 divide by 27 and a half years. And then every year I get to write off that depreciation. Um, in the tax world, we call it a paper loss. It's a paper loss because it's not a true loss of value. It's not a true loss of cash, right? It's just purchase price, I'm taking a, a, a dollar amount that I get to depreciate based on the government rules. Um, and so usually nine times out of 10, when we have rental properties, we can create the tax loss because there's so many different tricks we can do with depreciation itself. Like I said, the, the, the standard law is, you know, residential building, write it off little by little over 27 and a half years. But the IRS then further says, well, there's actually little things you can do. If you didn't want to do it over 27 and a half years, maybe you can write it off over five years or seven years or 15 years or take bonus on it. Um, and so it's with these little tricks within depreciation where we say, okay, well, you might have a very profitable real estate property, a rental property, but with these write-offs and depreciation, then we create a loss on the tax return. Yeah, beautiful. So something really popular right now in the real estate space are these three terms I'll kind of show out, I'll just kind of throw out there and see if you can help define them in simple ways. That was a great definition, by the way, of depreciation. So the three kind of terms I think that all kind of fit together are accelerated depreciation, bonus depreciation you hear a lot about decently right now, and then this thing called a cost seg report or a cost segregation. Could you explain just how those work together and how they help a, an investor who has rental properties 
pay either less or zero in tax. Yeah, for sure. So like I said that the standard depreciation for a residential property is 27 and a half years. Okay. But um, then people get smart and we say, okay, well then what exactly is the definition of a building? And can I then take this building and break out things that I don't deem to be building? And that's what a cost segregation is. The cost segregation says, okay, Sam bought this building for $500,000, but maybe Sam doesn't really know what, what makes up the building unless Sam just happens to be an engineer, right? So what we can do is we can hire cost segregation firms, most of them are the engineers, and they'll look at this specific building and say, okay, from this building, I'm going to break it out into components, which is cost, you know, cost segregation, separating out the cost of that $500,000 building. And so what they're doing, they're saying, okay, in this building, maybe there's $30,000 of specialty plumbing. Maybe there's another $100,000 worth of appliances and fixtures and, and little components and cabinetry. And once they do that, then us or your CPA will take a look at the components and say, well, guess what? If it is specialty plumbing, maybe I don't have to depreciate over 27 and a half years. Maybe I can do it over 15 years. Uh, maybe for some of the fixtures, I can do it over five or seven years. And when we're doing it over these shorter amount of times, you can see $100,000, if I have to take it over 27 years, it's going to be a much lower number than if I have $100,000 where I can write off all of it over a five-year period. So that's where that cost segregation concept comes from. Historically speaking, for rental real estate, that's done wonders for real estate investors, you know, just be able to accelerate some of the depreciation. Um, but what's amazing is in the last several years, the laws have changed temporarily to make that even better. And that's where you hear the term bonus depreciation. So bonus basically says any of these things that we are now calling five, seven or 15 year assets. I'm not even going to wait the five years. I'm just going to take immediately as much as I can in year number one. Um, and so, for example, if, you know, this year we're saying it's 60 percent bonus, that means, you know, if it was one hundred thousand uh, dollars, I'm not going to write it off over five years. I'm going to take 60,000 that immediately this year. And then the rest of the remaining 40, I'll take it over the next couple of years. And so th this is where you're seeing a lot of, or hearing a lot of people say, wow, I bought a rental. I did cost segregation, bonus depreciation, accelerated depreciation. And then I got a $200,000 loss. It's not losing money. It's very profitable by itself. But I've now supercharged the set of tax law to create a paper loss for tax purposes. Yeah, that's beautiful. I've really been enjoying some bonus depreciation on some of my property. And I think what's really interesting, I think what's really interesting about this concept is now you get investors, and I want to ask you about this because now you get investors that are looking to buy real estate who don't know anything about real estate only for depreciation. I, mean, I had someone come to me recently that was like, I need to try to write off I think I forget the actual number. I think he was going to owe maybe 400,000 in taxes. And he was like, I'm looking for a building just to get rid of the 400,000. I was like, well, great. Like what's the cash on cash return you need? He was like, yeah. return? I, I, I break even. <laughs> like if the building breaks even, I'm good. I don't want to pay $400,000 in taxes this year. So he was looking for some big multifamily building. Right. And I, I want your professional opinion on that exact scenario. Like, is it advisable in your opinion to buy a building so that I can pay zero in taxes? Even if that building just barely breaks even once all things are included. I'm curious your opinion on that. Yeah, I feel like that's uh, never a good idea. I hate to use the word never, but that's rarely ever a good idea, right? Um, because when it comes to taxes, uh, you know, our tax rate is never 100%. Right. So even like in the your friend example, the audience question we had, you know, six hundred thousand of income in California. I mean, I'm mostly paying maybe like 50 percent in taxes. So I never want to lose one hundred dollars just to save 50 dollars in taxes. Right. So as an investor, first and foremost, I'm still always looking for properties that cash flow and appreciate right if i can get both great if i can only get one of the two then i have to think about it what's more important to me at this stage in my career or in my in my financial journey um but yeah it never makes sense to just buy a property that's underperforming uh just for the tax benefits because um, again you know i never want to spend a hundred dollars i didn't need to just to save fifty dollars in taxes now the tax side does have an impact though on what you invest in and when you invest in um just like we were talking about with that audience question right if they're both working full-time um 
I mean, <clears throat> if their goal is to not pay tax on W-2 income, well, maybe we want to get a property close enough to them where one of them could be a real estate professional. Or if they're going to just continue working full time, then maybe we want the property to at least temporarily be a short term rental uh, or in the first year or for the, you know, the first two years. Right. So um, it does impact what kind of real estate and where the real estate is and when you buy during the year. But we never want to buy you know, a bad property or a mediocre property just to save on taxes. I love your perspective on that. So still vet it, still still make sure of what, what I'm hearing from you is really valuable. It's like, hey, make sure you're either getting cash flow from that thing or you're pretty dang sure it's going to appreciate because of where it is or what type of real estate asset it is. Or maybe there's a long-term lease on it with rent increases or something like that. Like make sure that thing is going to appreciate. I like that. I want to ask you because you've mentioned this real estate professional thing a couple of times, and I know this is basic for you, but I want to explain it to the audience in the simplest terms possible. What is this status that the IRS gives you called real estate professional and why is it so important and how does it help people actually pay less in taxes or reduce their tax bill to even zero in some cases if they own enough real estate? Yeah. Um, I mean, this is a topic we could probably talk for, I don't know, eight hours on or three, you know, there's like a eight hour long courses for CPAs about real estate professional because I think it's one of the most often missed and also misunderstood part of the tax code for real estate. So let me first tell you why we even care. Okay. So if you're someone who makes $100,000 or less or $150,000 or less, uh, your rental losses can offset your W-2 income just for everyone, almost everyone. Um, but we can only use up to 25000 So let's say Sam's total income is $100,000. We got a bunch of rental losses from depreciation and write-offs. We can use maybe up to $25,000 against your other types of income. That's it. No, no other questions we care about. But for those making over $150,000, your rental losses are generally considered passive losses, which means that the losses only offset taxes from other passive income. So if I got other rental properties and, you know, I can offset the, the, the profitable one with the one that has a loss. Now, for a lot of people who maybe like this person we're talking about, it's like, hey, I have a lot of income on my W-2. Um, how then can I use my rental loss against W-2 income? And so for higher income people, uh, the only way to do that, if you're talking about long-term rentals, is if you or your spouse is a real estate professional. So in other words, when you're a real estate professional, your rental losses are no longer limited. They can offset all types of income from your job, from your non-real estate business, right? So it kind of frees up those losses. Um, so naturally, the question is, what is a real estate professional? Then we all want to be a real estate professional. Um, now, the downside is it's not as simple as getting licensed in real estate, which a lot of people think like, great, I'll keep my job. I'm just going to get a real estate license and that's it. Um, so that's not true. Um, now, real estate professional IRS looks at a set of rules on basically what you are doing with respect to real estate. Um, one of the ones that's hardest for people to overcome is you have to have more hours in real estate than your job or other businesses. So if you're like a mortgage broker full time, you know you run a mortgage brokerage business and you spend 2000 hours there, you have to have more than 2000 hours in real estate to be a real estate professional. Same if you're a doctor or you're an attorney, you're working at a W2 job, we have to have more hours in real estate than your job to be a real and a mortgage a mortgage professional that wouldn't be considered like a real estate profession. Yes, I would have thought I'm a mortgage broker. I'm I get a free pass. Right? Yeah. Right. Or like a real estate CPA. <laughs> or a CPA. They, the IRS considers you a CPA. Yes, exactly. And a mortgage broker so, so doesn't count as a re, as a as a real estate professional. You don't automatically get that real estate professional status. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So, um, but a lot all types of other uh, professions do count. You know, if you're a realtor, broker, property manager, um, co-hosting, usually uh, syndicators, um, gosh, construction. You know, people in construction, development, all those like appraisers. Those are all real estate uh, activities. So, so, so if you are, but if you're your, your profession is not in real estate, then you have to have more time in real estate than your job to qualify. Um, but so this works well for a lot of our clients who maybe don't work full time or um, they have a spouse who's not working full time. So let's say you're a full time doctor, but you have a spouse who stay at home mom, then it's much easier for your spouse to qualify as a real estate professional because in that context, they just have to have 750 hours in real estate in that year, then they're automatically a real estate professional. Um, and, and so 
from that perspective, your spouse never has to be licensed as a real estate agent. You know, the IRS doesn't care about that. They're just looking at what are your, where are you spending most of your time? Do you meet those hours requirements? Um, and the beauty is, you know, we have clients who are like, okay, this person's a doctor and making $600,000 a year. Their spouse is a real estate professional. Well, guess what? Now all the rental losses start to offset the income on the medical practice too. So that's why it's, it's really important for people to um, consider real estate professional. For some of our clients, it's like they already met it. Their CPA just never knew how to claim it or report it correctly. Um, and then for some of our other clients, it's a multi-year strategy. You know, I, um, it's like I'm still working now, but maybe my plan is in three years or five years. I'm going to work less and, you know, have more time in real estate. So I think that's really beautiful. I know some couples who have all but forced their spouses to spend a lot of time in real estate so that they can claim this. This is how important it is. I've seen, I know some husbands who are like, baby, I need you to work in real estate so we can get this. I've seen it the other way around. Some wives be like, honey, you're, yeah. you're going to spend more time in real estate than your job. And I think isn't I think there's a minimum too. I don't I don't know what it is now. If it's three or four hundred, seven hundred and fifty. Yeah, seven hundred fifty hours. Okay, yeah. and you're going to spend at least seven hundred fifty hours in real estate activities, right? So, yes, I think uh, it it can be so powerful because everything we've talked about up until this point, whether it's depreciation, bonus depreciation, doing the cost seg reports to get that depreciation, it all now becomes like so much more applicable, right? At least in the short term. Yes. I mean, for people who just have W-2 income and rental income, absolutely, right? That's the point in time when you can kind of um, put the two together where losses and income start to offset each other. But we also um, have clients who just have other passive income too. You know, you might have other passive income from investing in a friend's business, or you have other passive income from other real estate you might own or syndication stuff that you might have. Um, and so I was, you know, because some CPAs, a lot of times CPAs will tell their clients, don't invest in real estate. You don't get any tax benefits because you have a full-time job and you're not a real estate professional. And that statement is not true all the time. You know, we have a lot of clients who, physicians as an example, physicians who, you know, maybe you're um, a family doctor, but you invested in an eye center or a surgery center, and that's kicking off a lot of passive income to you. Well, guess what? You don't even need to be a real estate professional because your rental losses can offset all that other passive income you're generating from medical practice as well, right? So um, that's just all the tax planning, like taking, really taking a deep dive into what makes sense for Sam versus what might make sense for Amanda might be two slightly different strategies. Yeah. Well, Amanda, I have to ask you this question. One of my big goals in life, my bucket list items, if you will, is to own a private jet. And so A, can, can I deduct a private jet? Can this can buying a private jet help me pay even less in taxes? Uh, and B, maybe your opinion on when is that a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, that's so funny because I'm my wife is um, listening to this particular part of the episode because, uh, yeah, I don't know if you talked to Brandon about that when you were in Maui, but that is one of his I goals too, is private did, chat. I, didn't, I did not talk to him about that. Um, but I will, I will find a way, Brandon, uh, this, find a way to talk private jets. Yes. Yes. He's got a whole schematic around that too. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not, uh, I guess it's not uncommon, you know, for, uh, people to be having that as the ultimate goal. And now absolutely there are a lot of people who, uh, utilize that or a big chunk of that as business deductions. Um, in fact, you know, a lot of celebrities, right. Uh, have private jets and you know, that's how they travel around for the different shows and things like that. And, uh, IRS came out earlier this year that they're going to be auditing more heavily on private jets uh, because it's such a huge tax saving area, right? So we're talking very large dollar amounts of depreciation and just ongoing maintenance and carrying costs. Um, so, I mean, so just, but not to like scare you from thinking about that as a, as a goal or deduction, just to say, but just to say that it is a valid strategy. And in fact, so many people use it where now the IRS is saying, okay, I just want to make sure people are using it correctly, right? That they're using it the right way. Um, and so it's just a matter of, you know, making sure you have the right documentation that when you're buying it and you're utilizing, you're able to prove that the primary purpose of that is for business purposes. Yeah, that's great. Thank you for that. Okay. Rachel, if you're listening to this, there you go. That's permission to buy a private jet <laughs> or at least rent one more often, right? Amanda, I want to ask, 
let's let's go ahead and say I'm someone who pays a lot of taxes and I want to reduce that to zero or less. That's my let's say that's my whole goal. I'm throwing this out there now. That is not my particular situation, but let's say that was my situation. We've talked a lot about real estate. And I do want to talk a little bit, one more thing about real estate I do want to talk about is a 1031 exchange because I want people to understand that, understand the power of that. But, bef- but before we do that, I want to ask this question. And that is, what are some other hacks? And I say, could be hacks, could be inside of real estate, could be outside of real estate that's, that, the, that the average person may not know about that they should be thinking about to reduce their tax burden significantly down less or zero. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's so many different things. You know, I think I would start with um, I would start with like what what type of investment um, are you mostly interested in, right? Because like we said earlier, we don't we don't make decisions based on taxes um, alone. We first start out with like what are the things that you're passionate about? Real estate, obviously, low hanging fruit for me at least, is most people who come to us already know they want to do real estate. And so if you're someone who's in the, you know, still working full-time W-2 or plan to do so in the near future, short-term rental, you know, the short-term rental loophole is really like a great starting point because you could keep your full-time job. Real estate could just be a side hustle. You could potentially use all those losses against your W-2 income without having to change anything. We have more and more clients getting into boutique hotels, um, you know, being becoming, uh, I don't know, they call it hoteliers. I don't even know if I'm pronouncing yeah, yeah, it right. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so... Hoteliers. Hoteliers, yeah, that's a very similar loophole where you can be owning a boutique hotel sort of on the side and potentially use it to offset W-2 income. And, you know, those are kind of just the real estate business side of it. Um, If you have a unique expertise, I always encourage my clients, like if you have a new unique expertise in something, um, make that a side job, right? A side business. So if you are a doctor, can you also moonlight, you know, do medical advising on the side, get to 99 income? Because now that we have that type of earned income outside of a W-2 is when you can start to write off expenses against that, right? Um, or if you're CPA working at a firm, well, maybe can you take on a couple of bookkeeping clients on the side that allows me to then have some expenses against it, reduce my overall taxes. Maybe I can contribute to a retirement account from my side business as well. So um, there are a lot of different strategies from that perspective. And, you know, a lot of our clients are are very charitable minded or they're very involved in, you know, their church or just um, different organizations they're passionate about. Charitable planning is a huge one in terms of how do we reduce our taxes through donations, donating, whether it's cash or appreciated assets where I'm not only donating, but also avoiding taxes on the same token. Um, But also, you know, just being able to give money to the charities rather than to the IRS, right? Yeah, those are some great things. I think it's so interesting how, and you probably know the tax code better than anybody, right? Or at least, but I know it's a huge (laughs) There's a lot of rules, a lot of documents. I'm sure there are people smarter than me in the, in the whole tax code. <laughs> but I think what's interesting is how these rules are written to favor. I think a lot of people are like, you know, there's a, there's a big movement in the United States right now that's like kind of uh, an anti, if you pay less in taxes, you're not doing your fair share. And then there's a whole argument. Maybe they, maybe we all, maybe rich people should pay more in taxes. I'm not saying that, but I'm saying like, they, I think what everybody also has to recognize at some level is that these tax codes were written to favor, as you just mentioned, people who have a business. It allows them to write stuff off where you wouldn't normally otherwise be able to do that. People who have real estate. And so I think that's just a really interesting thing to be out there and for people to understand that this is not this is not illegal. <laughs> yeah, and I think it's funny too, because I think because I post a lot of stuff on social media and sometimes I do get some of those um I don't know, hate or anti <laughs> messages is like, oh my gosh, you're evil. You're helping people uh, avoid taxes. But you're right. I mean, for us, the the key is understanding the tax law on what it is trying to incentivize us to do. And if what the government is incentivizing us to do aligns with what we want to do, then there's no reason why we shouldn't take advantage of the tax law. You know, I mean, you can see like even with, we talked about bonus depreciation a bit ago, 
So bonus depreciation used to be 100% bonus, then it became 80 and now it became 60. And as CPAs working with investors, I can see the significant impact it had on what our clients did. So like back in, um, you know, two years ago, we had clients who were aggressively buying properties, even though prices were so high, even though the interest rates weren't like super, super low, um, they were really aggressive on buying properties, providing housing for people, right? With all the refund they got, they didn't go out and buy a dime and ring or um, you know go on a vacation they're like okay i'm gonna reinvest all this back into real estate because the benefits because i want to grow my portfolio provide more housing and i think it's actually really beautiful when you see that government incentive being actually used for that specific purpose would you touch really briefly uh amanda and again kind of layman's terms here what's a 1031 exchange and how can that help you pay less and zero in taxes yeah, I mean, a 1031 exchange, um, yeah, it's funny, years ago, we used to be able to do 1031 exchange with everything. Now it's only limited to real estate. Um, 1031 exchange, I think that. the easiest. Yeah. What, what are some of the other things you used to be able to do 1031, like a car or like? A uh, car, exactly. Yeah. A car, certain types of assets. Yeah, you could have 1031 exchange, but now it's just uh, real property. So so real estate. Um, the easiest way to explain it is like the game of Monopoly. <laughs> so a Monopoly then we play we have all the little greenhouses I think once you get three or four or five of them you trade it up to a big red hotel and so in in the tax world normally if you get a bunch of single families and you sell them you're gonna have to pay capital gains taxes right like everybody else we gotta pay tax whatever we have left we then decide we're gonna reinvest in different types of, of, of properties so the 1031 exchange is specific to real estate where we say okay if you sell a rental property there is capital gains associated if you follow all the rules of the irs then you can 1031 exchange which means i don't have to pay any taxes on the property i just sold i take all of my profits and my proceeds and everything i can exchange it into another or multiple other properties and i don't have to pay the tax in the interim um, it's one of the most powerful ways that uh, our clients and also just you know investors everywhere are able to build wealth at a much faster pace, you know, because you bought something for a hundred thousand, you sell for five hundred thousand, pay no taxes on it, take the whole five hundred thousand, reinvest in something else. Like it's really a dream, right? That's beautiful. Such a great way to explain it. That's amazing. Well, I want to first of all, I just want to say I appreciate you so being so willing to kind of pull back the curtain and talk about some of these strategies. Obviously, you help people, your firm, your team helps people do these things and actually execute on these things every single day. But it's really cool that you're kind of showing behind the scenes and sharing all of this. I want to ask you something kind of circle back around to something that you said at the very beginning of this, you said, I used to work for a lot of wealthy people. And they would call me and they would ask questions like a person should use their CPA. So I want to ask you a very direct question. And that is, as we kind of wrap this up, I've just kind of got a couple final questions for you. How should someone use their CPA? Yeah, you know, I think... Um when we talk about taxes, like I said earlier, we, we, we tend to dread it. You know, it's kind of like a bad word. Nobody likes to talk about it. And, and I tell people, oh, you should do tax planning. I think people are really scared of it. It's like, I already don't want to talk about taxes. I got to deal with it once a year. Now you want me to do it multiple times a year? Like I'm going to talk to my CPA, no idea what they're saying. They don't know what I'm saying. It's just like, you know, the whole disconnect. The reality is tax planning is actually much easier than you think. When we do tax planning, it is simply me talking to a client about what is going on? First of all, what's going on right now? But more importantly, what do you expect to happen or do for the rest of this year and maybe into next year? And it's just in those conversations where then I can say, okay, because this is what you're planning on doing, let's consider A, B, or C, because if we do it these different ways, then maybe we get maximum tax savings. Or if we don't do it, then maybe this is what it's gonna cost us in terms of tax liability. And so, when we do planning with clients, contrary to popular belief, I am not telling them how to do cost segregation. I, I, my clients probably don't even know like the ins and outs of what it is, right? Um, they don't know, they don't have to calculate anything. They don't have to know the tax law. Um, the planning is really just very conversational. Like if I would be like, Sam, what, what is it that you plan to do for the rest of this year for your coaching? How many properties are you going to buy for your, your co-living? Right? You're going to do construction. What, what are we looking at? And it's in those very simple and um, 
uh, pleasant conversations with your CPA where the strategies will fall out. You know, I tell people it's your CPA's job to bring you the strategies. It is not your job to listen to podcasts, read books, YouTube endlessly about strategies to bring it to your CPA just for them to find 101 reasons why none of those will work for you, right? That If that's what you're experiencing, then that is not tax planning. Tax planning is when you talk to your CPA just about life investment business in general and from those conversations they give you tips and tricks and strategies on what you could or should be doing beautiful well said you know amanda you've had an amazing opportunity i think i asked brandon when he was on this podcast a very similar question to what i'm about to ask you i said hey brandon you've talked with probably more real estate investors than almost anybody you have like you're like the, I don't know if you know, uh, there's a guy, Napoleon Hill, who wrote a book called Think and Grow Rich. You ever heard of that book? And he just interviewed a crap ton of successful people. Well, Amanda, your superpower is that you've probably seen more tax returns than like most people could ever dream about seeing. I mean, I'm sure it's thousands and thousands, right? At some level, you've looked over thousands and thousands of people's tax returns. So I want to, you know, something Tony Robbins, which I know we're a mutual fan of, is like something Tony Robbins says constantly is that all of life is pattern recognition. Right? You start to see something enough, you start to see patterns. And so what I'd like to just ask you is like, having the experience you have, are there any other, maybe ones that we haven't talked about today, are there any other themes or patterns that you've noticed of people who kind of play that, that you would consider play the tax game well? Mm-hmm. And I guess to define what tax game well is, I guess like paying less in taxes <laughs> to define it clearly, right? We're like, have you noticed any other patterns or 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 or, or things that kind of just constantly pop up from those people who pay a lot of taxes or people who pay yeah. uh, a little bit of taxes? Obviously, mm-hmm. I'm curious your answer. For sure, you know, and I think it's all um, it's the people who take time to actually. Um, make taxes somewhat of a priority. And I don't I don't mean that like you have to be thinking about it all the time, right? But just people who understand how important uh, tax cost or savings could be. Um, most of our clients, you know, at that level uh, usually have two main things. One, they have a real estate business and the business could be Uh, coaching, it could be a syndication, right? Some kind of a real estate business that's sort of like the cash cow coming in. And then meanwhile, taking the earnings from those businesses and then reinvesting it into and scaling a portfolio. Um, Those are usually like the profile where we see somebody making a ton of money that that money is feeding the real estate and the real estate is feeding the tax benefit protecting the money that was generated right and um so i think that's kind of a recurring thing that we see with a lot of our clients and and also just people who um are comfortable in scaling you know because i think it's for a real estate investor i mean i think we all get to a point where it's like okay well i can no longer do it all by myself, right? I need a team, I need maybe investors um, or partners to kind of help me get to that next level. And the bigger your business is, the bigger the income level, the more real estate you sort of have or want to have. Um, And those kind of work together magically. You know, like I said, I mean, the tax code, I really, I mean, I love taxes because it's, it's actually so flexible. Right. The tax code is 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 I mean, like a lawyer uh, can interpret the law differently as our CPAs who interpret the tax code. If you ask us, you know, three CPAs the same question, you might get three different answers. I'm not saying anyone is right or wrong, because there is quite a bit of amb- ambiguity in there where you're able to kind of frame it in the way that will make the most sense. And I always tell my clients, you are the property owner. As a real estate investor, you own your real estate. You have 100% control over how much or how little you do with respect to each property. You're in control of where and when and whether you invest. And so we can create the right facts if you really want to save on taxes, right? But it does have to be created and actually implemented. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> I don't know why I just get giddy when anybody says we get to create the right facts for your situation to be great. That makes me very happy. Yeah. That's amazing. I really like, first of all, awesome, awesome answer. Such gems, such wisdom. Thank you so much for sharing all of that on this podcast. I really enjoy you expressing that pattern of like, 
we've got a cash cow and they get to just pour that into a real estate portfolio. And then that symbiotically benefits the cash cow. Because I do see, even in my coaching, I see a lot of people thinking maybe they saw it on a course, maybe they saw a really fancy, sexy ad that just thought, oh, if I go buy rental properties, that in and of itself will make me rich and I have no job and I have no way of investing and I have no money. And it's like, no, 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 no. Maybe you go wholesale. Maybe you go cre- do something that can create chunks of cash for you then to deploy into something that creates, you know, and how I teach it is something that creates generational wealth over the long term. But buying rental properties or multifamily properties in and of itself to create cash flow is not a get rich quick scheme. Yeah. <laughs> right? so, you know, and this is even this conversation is even helping me maybe shape how I coach my students that come in with that mindset of like, okay, let's let's talk about something completely differently. How do we create a cash cow? Because again, if, if all of life is pattern recognition and that's the pattern that you've seen and that frankly I've seen too for people who really do big and go big in this space, then that's mm-hmm. something we should come back around to. So yeah, really well said. I really appreciate that. Yeah. So, well, you're an example of that profile too, yeah. right? Yourself. <laughs> yes. yes, I am. It was martial arts business for a long time. I recently sold the martial arts business. I'm in the coaching business and I'm deploying the yeah. capital into co-living properties. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Well, Amanda, thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for your wisdom. Any final thoughts you'd like to wrap up with as we just kind of end this? I think uh, I'd like to just, how do people get in touch with you? How do they follow you? Uh, how do they how do they learn more from you? Or if they want to use you for taxes, how do they find out about your firm? Yes. Um, yeah, I think my final thought for people, I know we talked a lot about, um, you know, strategies for maybe people who own a lot of real estate, huge portfolio, stories about, you know, you or Brandon. But I think it's really important to also highlight that it just starts with one property. You know, we have clients who are just starting out in real estate. They make less than $100,000 a year. And with one rental property, you can use a lot of these same strategies. And you just need to start with one. And that could be life changing. We see a lot of clients who just started out with one and now they've built generational wealth for their kids and their grandkids. And, and you know, they're not bread and turners. They're just teachers, principals at schools, you know, all people from all walks of life because um, the tax law, you know, uh, contrary to popular belief, the tax law doesn't favor real estate investors. The law is the law. The same law applies to everyone. It's just about how we make it applicable to our each unique situation. Um, And so, yeah, anyone who's interested in more about taxes, uh, my company is called Keystone CPA. uh, And so you can check it out at keystonecpa.com. We have a lot of great free resources. If you want to know more about how to pay your kids and take a tax deduction for it, or what's the best legal entity for your real estate investing, uh, we have some great free resources there. If you're looking for daily tax tips, the best place to find me is on Instagram as Amanda Hunt CPA. Amazing. And we'll link all those in the show notes as well. So Amanda, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate you. And thank you for just bringing your wisdom to the show. Yeah, it was fun to be here. Guys, I'm not going to lie. That episode was fun for me because I need the reminder of how important it is to prioritize taxes, to to think about them, to talk to my CPA about them, to review them. So if you don't have a CPA or maybe that's your first step, just take some action from this episode. Maybe your first step is to be like, hey, is my CPA actually an investor? Have they been telling me the right information? I love her analogy about how a lawyer is interprets the law like a CPA interprets the tax code. There's interpretation around this stuff, right? So you want somebody that is going to look at your the interpretation that's going to favor you the best. And of course, keep you out of trouble. That is a key balance to play, I believe. <laughs> All of that being said, I, I hope number one, you please share this episode with someone that you think could benefit from this. Who do you know that makes good money and is probably or maybe or definitely paying a lot in taxes? They need to hear some of these concepts. They can start to think about this. Remember what I said when I intro this episode, a dollar saved is a dollar earned. Do you want to make more money? Well, let's start by saving more money on things we're already spending on. Thank you so much for your support of this podcast. It means so much to me. And I really, really hope that you're getting a ton of value from these. And I'll see you guys on the next episode. 